right, welcome. I see people coming in on already. Lovely to have you here. So as you're coming in, I just want to note that we have live transcript enabled for this event. So you can turn that on if you would like it. Just going to drop that in here. We also have our chat and our Q&A open. I'll be telling you more about that in a minute, but feel free to chat to other people who are in the event. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you have any questions for Matt, you can drop those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Don't worry if you're just coming in, I'm going to repeat all of this in just a minute. So yeah, once again, um, live transcripts are on. We'd love to hear where you're tuning in from. Right now we're representing a couple of time zones and I imagine that we've got some people tuning in from all times of day. Somebody from North Carolina, very good. We've got Boston, New York and Brighton up on the screen. And uh, yeah, one of the best things about getting to do things this way is just getting to meet all of you folks who we never would get to see in person. So thank you for being here. All right, let's get going. Welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith featuring Matt Haig for the comfort book in conversation with Mari Andrew. Live captions have been enabled for this event. If you would like to view the captions, you can find the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window, or if your screen is not maximized, Click, click the more option at the bottom of your screen to find it in the menu. These transcriptions are automatically generated. My name is Alex Schaffner and I'm the events director at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. Whether you know us well, or this is the very first time you're hearing about our store, thank you so, so much for deciding to be a part of our community today and joining us for our event with Matt. Thank you so much for those of you who paid your way in and for those of you who bought books. If you haven't already done so, I just want to note that we actually have signed book plates for the book, um, an unexpected treat. And you can still order a book with that book plate um, at the same link where you registered anytime between now and 9 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. If you've already done that, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate your support of an independent bookstore and an author whose work we truly value. The chat and question boxes are open, so feel free to make use of those. Remember to set your chat to all panelists and attendees if you'd like to chat with others in the audience. Please drop any and all author questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window so they're not lost in the chat. Please note that Brookline Booksmith has a strict policy against abusive behavior and language, and at our discretion, any attendee can be removed from an event for that behavior. I'd like to begin with a warm thank you to Mari Andrew for moderating this event. Mari is a writer, artist, and speaker based in New York City. She's the author of My Inner Sky and Am I There Yet? Her work is centered on the power of creativity as a medium for sorting yourself out in difficult times and imagining your future as better times. It's lovely to have her here. So Mari, thank you. Thank you. Now, it's my utter pleasure to introduce our guest author, Matt Haig. And I mean this very much, not just on behalf of the bookstore, but as a reader and a person, because Matt blends compassion and intelligence in all of his writing in a way that speaks to me as it does to many people, like very few writers do. His fiction isn't particularly tethered to genre. In his books, you might find a man who barely ages searching for a long lost daughter, or a very young modern Hamlet haunted by a traumatically lost father, or a young woman who is given the chance to see dozens of lives she could live instead of ending her own. But regardless of the who and the how, Matt's novels use their fantasticness as a home for something heartfelt, the quiet and insightful explorations of characters into their own emotions and their possibilities for happiness and peace. And this is what his nonfiction does as well. From his advocacy online to reasons to stay alive, notes from a nervous planet, and now the comfort book, Matt writes generously about the slippery and sometimes agonizing experiences of existing as a human being with the human psyche. His generosity is in sharing the worst tricks of his own mind and the best tricks he's ever found to entice it back over to his side. His compassion for anyone who might find his experiences familiar is evident in his quiet prose and his tireless championing of honesty and support around issues of mental illness. His books are very simply some of the only books I've ever read about mental illness and thought, ah, yes, this is someone who can put it into words. And even if he doesn't line up with you exactly, which nobody can, the places where you meet will be expressed so well that it's a relief just to read them. He offers his characters himself and his readers a grace that truly is a comfort to read. And so it's a joy to say, please welcome to Matt Haig and Mari Andrew. 
Thank you. Thank you, Alex. What a lovely, lovely um, introduction to who Matt is. We all love Matt Haig. It's such a joy to be here. Thank you so much for allowing me the pleasure. And I totally echo what, what Alex said. Um, you put to words um, what is very difficult to articulate. And uh, you've been that for me for many years. So it's really an honor to be here. And it's an honor to be fetching the comfort book, American cover, right here, <laughs> which is a very, very jaunty cover. Did you have any say in, in either the UK or the American one? Um, no, well, no, I, I didn't, but they did show me it. And I, I never know if you meant to, you know what, I mean, I suppose it's different for someone like you, who your work, you, you create the visual aspect. Uh -huh. I never know what the etiquette is. So, uh -huh. I, I, so I, I like, what I like is that the fact that the UK and the US have a completely different um, covers yes. for this. And I think yes. somewhere, somewhere between the two covers, there is what the book is, but you know, it's kind of like, it's partly, the sort of blue sky of the American cover and it's partly uh, the more sort of like yeah it's a I suppose that's more your standard sort of self-helpy cover isn't it but, sure, um, sure. <laughs> yeah so I don't I don't I don't know I, I I kind of especially when it's especially when it's a uh, a publisher not in your country you you kind of, it feels like I'll leave you to know what you did so yeah uh, yeah that seems reasonable <laughs> so that well, it's lovely both both are lovely um and I have to say I <laughs> when I heard you were coming out with this book I saw it on Instagram and I heard Matt Haig is, is uh, has a new book out very extremely prolific author um called The Comfort Book and I thought I don't care what that's about or what's in it I want a book called The Comfort Book by Matt Haig. That's my, that's a perfect book. I've never pressed pre-order so quickly. I was so excited about it. It's just, um, I just knew it was gonna be what I needed and what we needed and, and that it is. And it's such a gorgeous collection of, um, of quotes, other people's, and a lot of them are just little paragraphs you've written in some really meaty kind of essay yet, some smaller essays. And I've heard you talk about the fact that in the midst of this, this really massive depression that you, that you suffered, um, digesting, ingesting kind of bite-sized <laughs> bite -size, um, literature was really helpful for you and really kind of all that you could stomach. And I so, so relate to that. And I just want to thank you so much for making space on a thoughtful, thoughtful person's bookshelf for the bite size. Cause I think, you know, we have this idea of what a serious book is. And sometimes when you look through um, a book that has some, you know, kind of smaller vignettes, it's like, oh, well, are, you know, is, is this really serious literature? But it really is. And um, I wanted to know if you had any self-consciousness writing a book that was um, a bit, a bit, smaller, <laughs> smaller bites, or if that's something that you just knew people needed. So you just, wrote like no one was watching and went for it. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I've always been passionate. It sounds a weird thing to be passionate about, but I am passionate about short chapters. And my very first novel, which I doubt um, many people, certainly not many people in America ever read, it was uh, called The Last Family in England, but in America, it had a title change to The Labrador Pact. Anyway, that had a chapter in it that was four words. The rest of it had normal chapters, and then there was one chapter that just said there was a sound and it was just on the page. And I, I thought, oh, I, that, that's not. I and mean, since then, I've always, I've liked having really short chapters. And obviously in the comfort book, it's almost all um, short chapters. And I, I don't know. I don't know if it, um, I don't know. I just always like it. I, I, when I was ill, yeah, I could not read dense blocks of, prose or big you know it was kind of intimidating and I didn't want to sort of embark on it so I, I'd rather these little islands I, I used to read um, books of quotations and just grab them and get what I want there's also an, a lovely book called Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino which is uh, like a hundred different imaginary cities that are all kind of based on Venice and you can pick one and they just sort of 
they're lovely in terms of the words, but they're lovely that they're just a sort of square of text in the middle of the page. And there's just something so simple and pure about that. And I, I, I genuinely, um, I genuinely like that. I like the visual aspect of it. There's something quite easy. And for, in a book with comfort in the title, I thought it would make sense um, to present it in a very easy, accessible, clear, succinct kind of way. So that was my um, thinking. It, you know, I know you're 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 someone who literally has to think about the visual stuff as well. But I think even you know, words are visual things, and paragraphs are visual things, and sentences are visual things. So I try and think of that. Um, when I'm writing, because as a reader, it's something I, I, I think about. I, I'm a fat and, you know, there's been a trend, especially in my country, to equate difficulty with profundity. Yeah. To, to, yeah. to be suspicious of anything that slips down too easily. And, you know, it's almost like that can't be serious. That can't. And it, I think it's a relatively new thing. Well, certainly, like in terms of, world history it's kind of a new way to look at the world but things need to be difficult you know if you go back to sort of the ancient philosophers they were often trying to condense things into very short maxims almost slogans that they'd have on the walls and the academies in ancient Greece and stuff and they'd actually uh, want mottos and stuff to live by whereas now we have to have these sort of like I don't know everything has to be gravity's rainbow or really really sort of like um dense for people to take it seriously whereas you know i don't know maybe maybe i'm just want an e i want an easy read without shame i want a book to feel as easy as the beach boys sounds you know just a sort of like a smooth smooth sound and no you, you'd never listen to the beach boys and think oh they didn't try hard because i can understand that song but with books we have this kind of like i don't know I'm not, com I'm not comparing myself to the Beach Boys, by the way, I wouldn't do. Geniuses. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I like easiness. I love that. I love that you say that. That's actually so healing to me on a, on a personal <laughs> level. And I so agree. I mean, one thing that, that I've, I've heard you say and I completely relate, relate to is that when you have these kind of uh, more succinct, um, anything that you're ingesting, whether it's um, music or, and I, I love music so much as you do, and it's a huge inspiration to me as, as a writer and, um, and things that I read, I want to integrate these kind of mantras into my life. And um, when you have a book with um, much shorter, um, easy to digest ideas, which, I know succinctness is the hardest thing to do. So I really, really respect that. But then they kind of come into you like a mantra. It's not so difficult to get a line of a song in your head that really means a lot to you. And I so agree in this, this medium of books. It's like, why does this have to be the difficult thing? I was also thinking when I was reading this, you know, we have this idea of what serious literature is. And a lot of it, unfortunately, um, we associate with um, kind of cynicism and um, like kind of a rough outlook on life. And it was reminding me of a quote from my, my friend, the writer, Johnny Sun, people who ridicule positivity think positivity is easy, which is one of my favorite quotes. And your book isn't positive, but it's, it's hopeful. It's optimistic. Yeah. It's sentimental. Yeah. It's lovely. I'm wondering if that was hard for you to kind of summon that tone or if you're just in a really hopeful place and it just kind of came rushing out of your fingers well no I mean I wrote a lot of this book in like March April 2020 so this is kind of a genuinely a pandemic book but but that worst point of a pandemic where you know no one knew it was this sense it was like the Jaws music was playing in our heads and we had this just sense of foreboding that was getting closer and mm -hmm. In the UK, on the BBC, every night we have a news show called Newsnight, and it's a very dark, serious news programme, and um, it was particularly dark. I mean, literally, the studio's dark, and, and you know, it, it, it takes the most sort of pessimistic take on everything. So I was sort of addicted to that, and, I mean, it wasn't just COVID, was it, in 2020? Everything seemed to be unravelling, and um, I, so I wasn't, to be honest with you, at the start, I was not feeling in the most sort of zen calm hopeful place when i'm writing a book whether it's a novel or non-fiction i tend to be writing the book i want to read 
in that <laughs> moment. Mm -hmm. And so I thought rather than just try and sort of like think myself into a better place, I thought I'd try and write myself into a better place. And so very often when I've take that sort of slightly authoritative voice or that, you know, that sort of therapist voice, it's kind of like the voice I want to hear rather than necessarily the voice that's always the most easy or natural for me to have. So it's almost like me telling myself, me reminding myself, reminders. Um, you know, sometimes when you think of like, I know this will be placed in self-help se sections in bookstores, but I, my problem with the idea of self-help is that there's this suggestion that you have all the answers or you have a roadmap for someone and I'm definitely not the person with the complete roadmap. I'm sort of like in the journey. I'm in a much better place than I used to be. But I don't, I, I, I'm not going to tell you what time to go to bed or, you know, whether to eat gluten or not. I'm just kind of like um, trying to just, well, I do tell you to eat gluten because there's a chapter on pasta and there's another chapter on pizza. So. I love, love those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> unless you have a serious intolerance sure, but, sure. <laughs> um disclaimer um i know about american lawyers you have to cover <laughs> but, um yeah so i ha i i what was i saying yeah i basically i do feel and believe everything i write but sometimes i'm trying to sort of really um gravitate towards a part of myself that might be sort of suppressed and this has a sort of autobiographical um, purpose for me because when I was depressed, when I had a breakdown, when I was suicidal, um, diagnosed with panic disorder and depression at the age of 24, genuinely didn't believe I would live to be 25. Sounds melodramatic, but it was like a knowledge. I knew, like depression was so total and so pessimistic. So the opposite of the comfort book. My mind was so um, bleak um that I, I, and part of it I, i'm not going to blame it all on this but part of it was to do with my sort of perspective as a young man one that had been quite nurtured in a university environment um and then i did a, a master's degree at university and i was sort of almost conditioned and taught to distrust um optimism mm -hmm. to this, distrust you know beginnings and middle and ends happy endings happy songs I was a very sort of well slightly pretentious very cynical young man and a lot of what I write sometimes I'm I'm literally trying to hack into that younger version of myself because by finding some kind of hope and hope isn't the same as happiness hope is just a sort of faith in uncertainty really uh, things can change um, by having some kind of uh, hope that kept me alive. And I actually came to realize that the pessimism I had inside me was actually more inauthentic mm. than any optimism I was shunning. And not only inauthentic, entirely useless and dangerous. And so, you know, and then time slowly disproves depression because you stay alive to 25 and 26 and 46. And... Um, so I, I'm, I'm continually trying to nurture and grow the happy side of myself. I'm definitely not the happiest person on the planet or anything, but I understand the value in that, in optimism and in hope. So the comfort book, I, I'm almost like stubborn with it. It's almost, especially being British, I think it's a British thing and a male British thing. To You know, it's so like, everything has to be so cynical it's so easy to be cynical you can go on twitter and get twenty thousand likes just by saying the most cynical thing in the world and it's just so easy and it's harder to actually find an inauthentic uh, an authentic bulletproof optimism optimism isn't easy everyone else says oh here he comes with his live life laugh quote or whatever and it's like yeah but that's not what i'm saying i'm not saying we should just smile and everything's happy i'm saying actually it's okay not to be happy it's okay to just feel what you feel but people are so cynical about anything that's trying to make people feel better sometimes um yeah. but I, I i yeah sorry that became a bit of a rant i'm sorry but no um... that was that was perfect <laughs>
<laughs> uh, I could listen to you rant about about this exact topic for many hours. I um, it's interesting you talk about this book as kind of part of your journey because I I know that appreciating the smaller things in life was kind of a later thing for you, and and uh, you've spoken about how that was really difficult in the midst of depression to appreciate kind of simple, boring things. And a lot of what's in this wonderful book is, um, is, is just so much gratitude and appreciation for these really tender, small things that you seem really sensitive to at this point in your life. Um, where does this book kind of fit into your life narrative? Is it, is it a, uh, did you ever see it as kind of a letter to your younger self or um, is it maybe a triumph over that time or how do you see it fitting into kind of the way you, you mythologize your own journey? Yeah, I mean, I, it's not necessarily a triumph over that time. It's more a um, coming to terms with that time because I honestly think one thing that kept me iller for longer was not being able to come to terms, was not accepting I couldn't accept the diagnosis I got I couldn't accept I had a very binary way of thinking where I thought you're either a well person or you're an ill person you're either a sane person or you're a mad person and I um I resist that now and I realize that actually made me worse and I, I don't even call myself a better person or a happy person I am someone who's very often happy but I don't want to fix myself into any one thing because what I used to do when I was younger would say oh I'm a depressive and it's like I wasn't a depressive I was a person experiencing depression yeah. and the, the person experiencing the depression was bigger than the depression because there were things before the depression there were things after the depression depression was the weather system that was in my brain so now my attitude towards that is um one of really coming to terms with it and the way I come to terms with it is to actually see the good things that came out of the bad things by actually not wanting to relive those bad things I would not ever want to relive those bad things but um, to actually see that I've actually known more happiness in my life this side of depression than I ever did before I actually wasn't a particularly happy teenager or a child um, a lot of the time. That wasn't me, my default setting. It's something that I've had to work on. But I genuinely think I'm one of those people who's actually happier as an adult. I'm happier and I'm happier post-depression than I was pre-depression. So in a strange way, depression made me happy. It didn't make me happy while I was experiencing it, but the recovery from it gave me a new mindset, gave me more space to inhabit. Um, you know, before I would have actually probably said I was a happy person, but um, that kind of happiness involved escaping myself, um, alcohol, even drugs for a while. Um, or, you know, everything had to be turned up to 10. Um, you know, the sort of most intense, spiciest foods, um, you know, Tarantino, everything, you know, just full <laughs> stimulation, stimulation. And... <laughs> I did, had no appreciation of new neutrality. I never wanted to just be inside my head for like two minutes and just be quiet. And I really realized actually it's not being quiet. You're actually more alive in some ways when you're sort of in tune with nature or you're having a quiet walk or I, I'm lucky enough to live by the sea. So we walk to the sea and just um, find a beach with no people on it and I, I, I love that stuff now and I live for it, but I missed, I missed the sort of neutrality of existence of just sort of enjoying your own breath and just, I'm not going to turn this into a yoga studio, but, uh, you know. Well, that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> a guided meditation with yeah, that. A guided, a guided meditation. <laughs> uh yeah no i i have been i've been talking about breathing techniques today actually um there is a thing called square breathing which i it's useful have you heard of square breathing oh yeah, yeah. i'm a yeah. i'm a practitioner yeah <laughs> yeah it yeah. actually works that actually you know it's not it's not it doesn't work for everything but it, if you if you're in a panicky moment if you can force yourself anyway sorry i am turning this into a yoga yoga session. it's wonderful yes <laughs> Four, count of four, count of four, count of four, right? Yeah. Just, uh, visualizing, visualizing a little yes. line. Yes. Um, 
Everyone do that before you go to sleep tonight. Uh, yeah. It's beautiful. Um, what you're saying remind me of one of my favorite parts uh, in a little little essay at here, love and dis love slash despair, where you say, "My love of life stems almost directly from despair." in the sense that I am grateful for better times having known terrible times, but in a deeper sense too, in the sense that pleasure and despair are contained in the same whole. And when we start to see the connections between all things, when we see how opposites are contained within each other, when we see the way everything connects, we can feel more empowered at our lowest points. I really love that so much. <laughs> I, I'm so interested in the relationship between pain and joy and I agree. I, I mean, I think about the times of my life I never would have asked for and were so, so debilitating. And um, the and, and being on this side, the level of joy I can experience. And it's not, I love this because it's not about, oh, to know great pain is to know great joy. It's not like a platitude, like, oh, you know, this pain has a purpose, which I'm really uncomfortable with the with the idea of that. But just that it's part of a whole life, right? It's like when you're experiencing this deep pain, you're like contributing to the wholeness of your life. And yep. with a whole, a more whole life, you're going to feel this like deeper joy. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a scientist, a scientist who says that they can uh, literally, if you understand fully a grain of sand, you can understand the entire universe. I think you can take a moment in your life and within that if, if you could do a, if you could turn that moment into a molecule you would actually see traces of every single moment in your life you'd understand your entire autobiography within that one moment and even you know de even depression itself there were moments of beauty and wonder but they weren't moments without pain you know my depression was very 24 7 but there were times when i'd look at like um and if, it, if I explain this to someone who, who hasn't gone through depression, sometimes they think I'm like being, uh, I don't know, too flippant or too easy, but there genuinely were moments where I would take the rubbish out, take the trash out, and I would just then just catch a glimpse of the night sky. And we were living in the north of England, which didn't have much pollution and would be this clear um, night sky. And it wasn't like that would make my depression dissolve or anything, but it, would, it was almost as if the world was making itself more beautiful. And I was appreciating the beauty of the world because I was in pain, because I was like, no, you have to stay in this world because there will be a time where you can appreciate this beauty. You can appreciate nature. You can appreciate skies. You can appreciate all these timeless, eternal things about living as a sort of sentient being on this planet and then um i found that uh you know i found i found those moments of wonder within the pain so it's it's not a case of like oh pain has meaning in and of itself and like you know is the purpose it's more that everything has meaning and that, that meaning is all wrapped up together it's all it's all a kind of whole and i feel like in the west it might not be an east-west thing, but I feel like, you know, if you if you think of the sort of stereotypes of western thinking versus eastern thinking, um, western thinking tends towards compartmentalization and individualism, and yeah, uh, whereas you, you know something like Buddhism and Taoism, it's all about the whole and acceptance of suffering and joy, and whereas in the west we we just sort of you know well america obviously pursuits of happiness but the whole idea that we kind of have to be happy all the time can actually sometimes create its own um problems uh, because we feel like we're failing at something whereas sometimes it's much easier to accept the thing and that you know when i think of my happiest times my moments of actual joy it's very often when i'm not being trying to be happy it's not mm -hmm. like i'm you know, it's, it's when you actually forget yourself a little bit and when you're sort of like dancing or having a laugh with a friend or you're not, you're totally in there. You're not totally wrapped up. So I, I try and um, remind myself of that and other people in the company. Yes.
Absolutely. Yes, I, I completely agree. I thought a lot about uh, this, this question of pain because I'm, I was very often told during the hardest times of my life, you know, you'll learn from this or you'll get stronger, yeah. any number of that, you'll enjoy life more. And I just thought it's not worth it. Like, this is too hard. It's not, it's not worth being happier at the end. I don't want to go through this. And so I've thought a lot about, you know, what is, uh, how do I think about pain? Because I have gotten some of the most incredible lessons and creativity of my life from pain. So what do I do with that? And what I've come to terms with is anything that we really pay our attention to will have something to teach us. And there's nothing like pain to grab your attention. It's just kind of, it's all consuming and, and you do lose yourself in pain the way that you can lose yourself in joy. And um, there's, there's something so educational about those moments that really take our attention. Um, I was wondering, because you said that you, um, have become in your journey so much more sensitive to these beautiful, small, tender things, nature and breathing and, um, and just the little boring moments that you wouldn't have appreciated in your 20s. I assume, I don't know for sure, but I think this is how it works. You usually become more sensitive to terrible things when you, when you get more sensitive to the beautiful things. And I'm wondering as a, as a now sensitive person, now more sensitive person, um, how do you cope um, with a world that where the news exists and where criticism exists and where social media is so intense. How do you, um, how do you cope with all that as a sensitive soul? Um, well, it depends which aspect. I mean, my worst aspect is Twitter. I've been so, it's my, it's my one week. This is why I would refrain from saying I'm a self-help author because if I was a self-help author, I would actually practice what I preach and never, <laughs> Never go on Twitter. Um, uh, Twitter is a net negative. I am absolutely sure. I mean, there's great things about um, Twitter, obviously, and you connect with people and it's, it's great for awareness of social causes. And it, there are positive aspects, but I think from a mental health perspective, it's addictive, it's aggravating. Um, you know, when, when they did those non-ethical experiments on mice and rats and addiction back in the 1950s, um, the, the mice don't get addicted if they get a treat every time they press the lever. Um, they get addicted when more often than not, they don't get the reward for pressing the lever, but occasionally they get the reward <laughs> pressing the lever. And I think that's social media, isn't it? It's kind of like most of the time, it's not worth it, but and occasionally you'll have sort of a moment of a really great conversation or you'll set the world on fire with a thing that you've made or someone will find you really funny and you'll be like, ah, oh, that's good. And, <laughs> and most of the time it's like, especially on Twitter, it's kind of like, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I don't know. I used to genuinely, it sounds really, silly and patronizing but I genuinely used to enjoy Twitter when I had less than uh when I just had a few thousand or a few hundred followers and then when you you get into like a lot of followers Twitter's almost impossible really and I'm quite I'm I'm not I'm a strange mix of kind of like sensitive but also um opinionated <laughs> so that's a good mix it's a bad mix for Twitter, though. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Not a healthy mix for Twitter. So I would, I would, um, and I would forget that I'm not. I haven't just got a hundred followers. I've got like you know a few thousand. So I, I, I would type away and then um, say something, and uh, yeah, get into. Uh, someone would just come and I'd go back and I don't do that anymore I don't fight on Twitter too much anymore where I can help it and I had two months off Twitter actually earlier this year nice I'm planning to do that again and I'm planning I'm planning planning is terrible isn't it to plan to, it's like planning to stop drinking I'm planning to delete my account at some point because it serves no practical purpose I think actually you know people say oh you just have it like for your business and marketing I'm pretty sure if anything it actually puts people off buying my books if they follow me on Twitter because they think well, he's annoying so uh, 
Well, as I, I, feel, I don't. I mean, you're you're more an Instagram person, aren't you? Um, yeah, because yeah. it's uh, the yeah, I I I really like Instagram. I know Instagram has its problems, and I know it can sort of make people compare themselves yeah. to other people. It has that aspect of it. But for me, as middle aged writer man who who's not there to sort of like you know um, get loads of likes for my pictures it's nice to just sort of play about with words on there and um uh, and i i find people it may be a little bit fake i don't know but i would prefer fake positive to that fake fury of twitter you know if you yeah, if you if, if sure. you're gonna pick a fake <laughs> give me that one. yeah pick the good one right <laughs> You strike me as someone who has like fun on Instagram, which I'm trying to get back to. You seem, it seems almost kind of like a, a playful scrapbook for you. It doesn't seem like you're too attached to the outcome. It seems like um, just a nice place to be for you. Yeah. Do you go in with much intention there? Is it, is it genuinely as fun as it looks? No, I'm really, I find it funny, like how, how people imagine that you, everything must be constructed and like I, I know there's a cynical aspect to uh you know a, a, a good kind of cynicism where you you have to you know if someone if someone a reality tv star is drinking a product of something you want you want transparency about what they're doing so people are cynical but I celebrated my birthday recently on and I put a picture up of my birthday on Instagram and it was me having a I me with a bike and a birthday cake because I got a bike for the first time since I was eight oh, nice. and, and um, a birthday cake and then someone said oh oh you got given that bike as a gift and it's an advert and you should come clean that it's an ad and that that cake was and it's like not everything you see <laughs> it's not all the Truman Show you know some people are actually <laughs> sometimes it's just a photo it's not always it's not always a conspiracy it's uh -huh. sometimes a person um having a birthday and that was a bike that my kids got me for my birthday but um yeah so i i in my case i'm not i'm i probably need to be a bit more professional now about it but um yeah normally it's even me uh what i like to do is test test things on Instagram I find Instagram a good mm -hmm. I don't know about you but it's a good you, you get an idea of what will work and won't work in in a book or things and I often use Instagram stories to test out titles or nice. concepts and um, I'm always quite open about what I'm working on and things like that but um, yeah I'm a comfort book I mean the comfort book a lot of the comfort book was tested on Instagram and like if it you know I, I I was sort of almost focus grouping it where if if it wasn't you know um doing very well i think ah oh, do i need that chapter uh, I, I, I. and so you so and it's interesting to see how what people respond to and how they respond to it as i'm sure you find yourself because it's not always predictable it's there's sometimes sometimes you think something's really great in your head and you'll you'll put it out there and no one else will really connect with it and then other times there'll be a thing that you do kind of lazily and then people really are, oh yeah that's right so I find that interesting it's a, it, it's something that you know when I started writing in, professionally in 2004 you know social media as it is now did not exist then and so I really you know value that as as a way to to not have to wait and hold your breath until a book is out in the world to have any idea of how people are going to respond to your stuff so it is kind of nice and i think it's democratized the writer reader relationship so that um it's more back to the campfire it's kind of like you're actually well if you're open to it you're you're you can listen to readers you don't have to obviously conform to what they're saying but it's sometimes interesting to listen to why they think a certain thing and you know to to hear other voices um yeah i did it a lot with the midnight library actually you know i was working on different um ideas in fact the the in the midnight library came out of social media because i didn't know whether it should be midnight library or the midnight library and it was one of those things that i'd overthought it's like I'd ever thought if it should be the yeah, of course. <laughs> and, 
and it was i can still remember it was it was literally 66 33 66 percent wanted the definite article wow. <laughs> The, the, people spoke. the people have spoken yeah so i had my evidence that i should but you know so in that sense i i did just go with the majority decision because i didn't have strong feelings either way but sometimes i will uh like there's a novel i'm working on at the moment which is possibly a sequel to hansel and gretel kind of like a gretel story but in the modern world or in the 1980s and gretel and overcoming trauma and people aren't really getting it but i'm still convinced that i can actually find a way to um make it work so sometimes it's a test of your ideas if people aren't liking it but you still feel passionate about it then that's probably telling you something that you 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 should actually pursue this because they're not quite seeing what it is yet when you just said that but you know um even the midnight library had a bit of that at the start it's like well, hasn't that been done a million times parallel lives da, da, da. but um so you sometimes just have to know your own uh y y the energy inside you that's the bit that people can't see isn't it from social media they can't see what you could do with something of a passion you have for something or that so you sometimes have to trust yourself too right and and your intuition seems to have served you very well but um yeah i it's an interesting uh it's an interesting little balance between you know feeling so much probably more connected to your audience now than than you ever have as a writer you know getting getting this kind of instant feedback but also um you've shared this quote and and i i think about it a lot the you know uh paraphrasing Plato that ideas are more interesting to, to debate than people and and when you are on social media you become an idea you're not really like a full human anymore so um you can feel so connected to your audience but the audience is an idea too you know it's they're kind of abstract as well um I, I have one more time for one more question time is flying by but I wanted to get this in selfishly because it was about my favorite my favorite essay it's called negative capability which uh, Keats coined, and Keats is my favorite poet, so I freaked out when I saw this, uh, meaning when someone is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching for fact and reason. I loved that, and I see that as kind of a through line of the book. Um, you're not a self-help guru yet, although you have some very zen ideas about, about uh, detaching and, and um, releasing control, which I love very much. Um, it is easier to sit in negative capability when things are going really well. It's like, what wonders could fill my life today? And of course, it's much harder when you're in the depths of despair or, you know, a, a pandemic. Um, I'm wondering how you embraced the not knowing as a way to move through hard times. Um, I think it's... It was hard for me because I I used to really a lot of my panic and anxiety came from uncertainty. So to actually turn that on its head and to actually see uncertainty as a positive, as a permanently potential positive, was um, so important to me. So it, 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 you know we were talking just before we came on about religion and like. How I used to be atheist and so I'm now agnostic, but I'm agnostic not just in a religious sense, sort of almost about everything, you know, agnostic about everything. Mm -hmm. So everything is full of sort of doubt and faith simultaneously. Like I feel I feel like it's I, I feel like uncertainty is about um I don't know who said it recently, but said something about how the ratios change. It's only the ratios that change. Everything else, it's all the same. Everything contains hope and despair and happiness and suffering it, all at once, but it's just that the ratios always change. So there are jokes and smiles and laughs in a funeral. There are sort of jealousies and sadnesses at weddings. You know, everything's all kind of contained uh, everywhere we go. And... Um, I think I think embracing uncertainty is kind of there's a certainty paradoxically about embracing uncertainty and that certainty is that change is real um everything's in motion and within every single thing there is every single thing so we whatever times whatever is thrown at you there will somewhere within that if you look for it be something 
to hold on to. There will be something that um, can sustain you long enough to, to get through it. And I genuinely believe that. And I wrote a book called Reasons to Stay Alive about a period in my life when I didn't um, believe I had any reasons to stay alive. And that was because I, not because I had too much uncertainty, but because I had too much certainty, because I was certain of wrong things. I was certain everything was going to be catastrophe. And I was certain I was going to be in a straitjacket and or, or dead and all of that. So um, uncertainty is, is, is just accurate. Uncertainty is accurate. You, you can never know. We're not Nostradamus. We can't ever know the future. So it's about embracing our limitations and um, actually being okay with that. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't want to know everything anyway. Can you imagine a world where you knew everything? Uh, it'd just be like reading a book for the 70th time. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what we're here for. That's what keeps us turning the pages, isn't it? Uncertainty. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful answer. And Reasons to Stay Alive is a book that means so much to me. Everyone should read it. Um, if they haven't already, it's incredible. And as is the comfort book, thank you so much for talking to me about it. I'll turn it over to Alex now for audience questions. Oh, thank you both so much. This has been a really lovely conversation to get to sit in on. And we do have some really excellent audience questions. Um, so just as a starting point, SM says, how do you choose to be so authentic in your writing? Do you view it as a choice? Um, well, I'm very pleased that you, you, you feel I am authentic. I, I feel like, you know, truth is the most important thing, even if you're writing fiction. I, I feel like you don't have to write perfectly. Um, in fact you can't write perfectly there's no such thing as a perfect novel and you, you kind of what the most you can hope for is to try and um mean what you say and try and be authentic and i think if you're authentic in something um and i don't mean authentic in the sense of realism or or describing a scene accurately or describing a wallpaper accurately i mean some sort of emotional authenticity then people are going to respond um, to it um, and yeah I mean I've always I, I wouldn't say I always succeed at that but I always aim for that um, and I think part of it with me comes again from years of actually not being like that from years where I don't mean just in writing I mean in life I went for a long time not being honest with myself or with other people about my own experiences for instance of depression I um, used to pretend I was okay when I wasn't okay a lot of the time. Um, I used to pretend to be a certain type of man that I wasn't, to be interested in sports that I wasn't, just to survive at school. Um, you know, a lot of school years uh, for everyone, I suppose, is, is a kind of wearing masks. So, and I saw a lot of the harm that caused me uh, and caused other people. So I do make a kind of almost rebellious point about really heading towards... Um, sort of emotional truth and honesty because I can see a lot of harm that's done by people um, masking emotions masking things so and I feel like books are a relatively safe space where you can do that you know the, the book I wrote about my um, depression reasons to stay alive as I was writing that um, there were members of my immediate family who did not know what I was going through and yet somehow I, I felt almost like Clark Kent after he's gone in the phone box I felt like I could like have this strength by writing that I wasn't having in normal face-to-face -face conversations so I feel braver in writing than I do often um talking to people or um not Mari obviously she 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 brought out she brought out my true self but um yeah I, I'll, I'll still often sort of struggle with I'll get nervous um with people whereas I almost adopt a sort of super strong voice sometimes in in writing that is kind of like a real part of me but a part of me that's often um hidden so yeah I'm, I'm aware I'm aware of that but yeah that's very nice actually <laughs> well in the writing it's interesting because you get to sort of uh create the terms of engagement when yeah. you're working through something 
that's with you first before it sees anybody else. Um, and I think that the real time reacting to other yeah. people's responses really changes yeah. how you're able to communicate things. Yeah, um, that, that is true. I mean, I, I, and even though I use social media to sort of like get feedback, I still think there's something that when you're on your own with a Word document, or as I used to do, I used to do notepad for ages. I used to sort of romanticize the writer's life and feel like I should <laughs> be actually writing. A special pen. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's something where it's very private, that act of writing. It's always, it's always, um, it always feels kind of alone, but in a good way. It's kind of like you can just do what you want. And that doesn't really change whatever stage you're at in your career. It's always just you and, the word document and then when you publish it that's the bit that changes but the, actual, <laughs> the writing's the same well that leads really nicely into a question we have from veronica who says how do you deal with negative criticism do you feel affected by it even if you get many more positive comments about your work the thing is the more positive comments you get the more negative comments you get i mean that's just the law of averages and so it depends with me I'm, I fluctuate a lot. I don't know what other people are like, but I fluctuate a lot. So sometimes it doesn't get in at all. Like I, I, I sort of like feel like bulletproof and nothing can get in. And then I'll have patches, whether it's because I'm like tired or weak or I've been struggling with an idea or uh, you know, things aren't going too well or I've been ill or something. And then, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. It does, it does sort of get in. You know, I am kind of, thin-skinned in good ways and bad ways but I'm getting better at dealing with that I think you know the sheer volume of positive and negative I've had within the space of this year has been like <laughs> intense um I mean but 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 for instance like five years ago I wouldn't have been brave enough to write a book like the comfort book um because I would have thought it would be it'd be setting myself a little bit too open for like people satirizing it or mocking it and I almost like when I'm writing something like the comfort book now it, that's almost like a, a a not an incentive but it's so I, it makes me so determined to write it because I feel like well this is the book I want to write and those negative voices um are reasons you know to ignore them because you know I, I i used to be like that and i i i wanted to embrace outside of it so um sometimes the criticism is almost useful because you can work out you can you know sometimes there's valid criticism but very often there's a different type of criticism and when you sense the kind of wrong kind of criticism it can be a fuel for you to sort of be stubborn and ignore it i haven't explained that very well but um yeah I need to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, and Veronica actually has a second question, which I will ask because I think it it speaks a bit to, to what you were saying there at the end um, about okay. the, the expectations that people set on writers and other people who are publicly speaking. Um, mm -hmm. Veronica says, I feel like these days people expect that writers or anyone with a high number of followers use their platform to express their opinion on important political, social, economic issues that happen in the world. How do you yeah. feel about that? And have you received criticism for not speaking out on any of these topics? Well, you know, it's it's kind of a trap. I mean, I, I, I feel, yeah, I mean, I felt pressure to speak out on things that I don't feel qualified to speak out on. I think a lot of people, and then of course, the response is, well, you should educate yourself on that. But there's, a, there's about 20,000 crucial issues that we all need to educate ourselves on. And we either want to sort of make change for good in an area that we're passionate about and that we actually feel qualified to talk about mm -hmm. or not. So I used to be the type who felt like I, I should have an opinion on everything. And this is a sort of Twitter mentality. And you, you end up wading into issues and, and being cross about things um, that when you really stand back, you think, why, why, why am I engaging what what new thing am i adding to this conversation what change is that actually creating and when you start to sort of analyze it a bit it makes you a little bit more careful with um the issues you get involved with 
and not get involved. But obviously, mm -hmm. there are important major social issues where you have to have an opinion or you have to, you know, comment on, you know, racism, misogyny, um, you know, things like that. But when it when it's every micro thing needs every statement coming out of a politician or you know during the trump era every single tweet would have to be commented on it's like do we... <laughs> everything's so micro and in the present and um i won't turn this into a therapy session but young <laughs> uh, carl gustav young the famous um psychoanalyst he said there's two there's two truths there's the um there's the true facts about engaging with the news and reality and external reality and there's the inner eternal truth and if you balance um too far one way or the other you'll go mad and i feel like in the sort of modern twitter world you're permanently plugged into um the modern moment outside of yourself to a way that you you lose a sort of human um truth and you see people and journalists who, who it's their jobs now to just be on twitter all day long and it can't be good um can't be it can't be good i know it's not good because I, I used to do that myself i used to spend i spent the whole of 2016 being angry on the internet and it was like the worst year well not the worst year of my life but it was not a good use of um time anyway mm -hmm. sorry, i've spoken far too much about twitter in this uh, <laughs> well that's twitter people. for you it sort of takes yeah, care of everything i know i'm talking <laughs> about comfort and i've mentioned the like, everything's over <laughs> um let's see so we have an anonymous question which is my sister has found that believing in herself has done more for her depression than any religious belief or form of spirituality has and she's tried them all do you think there's something to this believing in herself um yeah well i mean I, I think ultimately that's what we we think we actually know is ourselves and um i feel like i was someone who really struggled with self-confidence and i really relate that to me getting ill by having very low self-esteem um when I was younger and having a lot of negative voices about myself. And so actually, you know, I don't know if it's what, what believing in yourself really means, but certainly extending kindness to yourself and giving yourself a little bit of slack when you most need it and not beating yourself up about um, being non-productive when you can't be productive and all of that stuff, I think is so um, vital. And I think we need to teach children and young people um more about that you know we, mm -hmm. we we live both in your country and my country and it's a kind of culture of self-improvement and self-enhancement and while it is always important to have some sort of forward drive in life i feel like when that's the only thing mm -hmm. when we're always goal orientated and wanting the next thing and the next thing um it's very we can lose ourselves quite quite quickly and um, so we need is alongside self-improvement we need self-acceptance and we need to actually be a lot kinder um to each other and to ourselves and mm -hmm. um yeah so yeah i'm a, i'm a, i'm a i'm a, a great believer in self-kindness um certainly that's a very good answer uh, we have a couple of questions about writing and reading, and then we're going to be just about out of time, but I'd love to get through these. Um, okay. Christy just would like to know, and you've mentioned a couple of things already, um, what books, what genres do you read, and sort of how do you decide what, what you'd like to read? That's good. Um, I, you know, speaking, going back to what Mari was saying about my short chapters, honestly, um, my genre is short books. I like short books. <laughs> Relate to that. <laughs> I, I, nothing will put me off more than a 900 page. Uh, I have read one or two of those in my life and I had to read a few at university, but I am, I am too fickle to, to risk it. 
were so I like I like books that manage to pack a lot into a short um, a short uh, time frame. I like um, all kinds of things. I like philosophy. Um, so this last year, I've been reading a lot of philosophy. Um, I'm a great believer in popularizing philosophy because I, I feel like we're all um, philosophers um, and everyone's interested in philosophy, but we're put off by the academic connotations of philosophy. Mm -hmm. But philosophy is just thinking about stuff. And we've all been doing that uh, for the last 15 months. And um, yeah, so, okay, you want examples of what I've been reading. Well, Anne Lamott, who, who men uh, mentioned, uh, well, we didn't mention, but me and Mari were talking about her before. Um, there's a great book I read, um, which has a very uh, self-help kind of cover, certainly in my country, When Things Fall Apart by Pima mm -hmm. Chodra, um, which is, is a great book about uncertainty and hope. Um, Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet is probably my all-time favorite book um it's wise and it's full of life advice and it literally is letters to a young poet and it's about sexuality it's about um uh, writing it's about life it's about uh, you know love and hope and depression and all those things and it's also incredibly short it's like about 95 pages the whole thing it's just 12 letters and it contains the universe i love a book that contains a whole universe in a um short um you know read it in an afternoon kind of uh kind of way um, that's such What's a good that? answer you know i think probably short books are my genres <laughs> one of the reasons that I enjoy your book so much. So <laughs> I think that's a very relatable answer. Um, and it's true that sometimes if you can say it briefly, you can say yep. it best. So um, I think that, that holds true. Um, but speaking of saying things, Janet would like to know if an idea comes to you and you know that you're going to write it, such as an essay, an article, a book, et cetera, um, how do you get started and what's your process? Um, yeah, my process is quite random. Um, I go for <laughs> a period of not writing or producing anything and then being very in it. I, I'm not a planner, uh, so I will write, I, if, I, if it's a novel, I will just write the scene I most want to write, uh, most interesting. I think the way to avoid filler is to always write the part that most excites you in that moment. So. I'm not a consecutive writer. I don't write chronologically mm -hmm. uh, or even logically necessarily. I just sort of write what's there and sort of go with a dream, which makes editing sometimes, certainly with Midnight Library, quite a nightmare. But I feel like it... <laughs> I can it. imagine. That's such a structurally complex <laughs> book anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but it ends up... Yeah, hopefully it ends up um, with less, you know, empty bits and less sort of exposition of getting A to B and just try and um, write what you want to write in that moment. So I very rarely start writing a book at the beginning of the book, um, or certainly it won't end up being the beginning of the book. Uh, very often the first chapter is the last chapter I write. Um, it was with the Midnight Library, actually. Uh, the Comfort Book was the easiest book in, in the sense that it was formless. So I did not have to write worry about um, order at all. I did not have to worry about those things you worry about in novels, about timing or whether Humphrey is wearing a different type of jacket and or whether it's snowing and then it's not snowing because it's July or something. So um, I loved writing The Comfort Book because it was literally just writing the bits that are normally my indulgent bits where I'm sort of stepping out and philosophizing, but it was a whole book of that. So I really liked it. It was a very me kind of book. That's so interesting. I, I was actually wondering about um, last thing. We have thunder here and I know that it's late there, but I always find it so curious with your, with your nonfiction, um, sort of the the choices that you make about the placement of each like tiny essay or piece, um, how how do you arrive at sort of like the rhythm of what you're what you're sharing? How do you get those pieces into the order that feels correct and complete? Um, I yeah, I don't know. It is a feeling, I suppose, isn't it? I suppose it's a bit uh, 
it's like music or something. I'm not mm -hmm. saying so like music, but it's kind of like a balance. Um, with the comfort book, it's interesting because originally there was a kind of structure in the sense that I was going to do it around the four elements. So there's four parts in the comfort book. So it was going to be fire, earth, water, air. And I abandoned that because I thought it was a bit pretentious. And also a lot <laughs> had nothing to do had nothing to do with <laughs> fire or earth and water and air. So I thought, yeah, that's stretching it. But if you <laughs> if you read it, if you reread it, not that you should, but if you reread it and realize um, I did originally have that, there is there's some chapters that are all together around the theme of flow and water and rivers and then there's others that are fire. And uh, I, I think even the pizza's in the fire section, the flame grilled pizza. Uh, so, so there was kind of, there was more, there was more logic to it than it seems. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes it's as simple as, oh, this is a long chapter, so I better have a really short chapter after it. Or, oh, this is quite a heavy chapter about philosophy, so let's just have a list after it. And just, you know, it's kind of like, what, what will my brain want after reading that yeah, it's like a, a mixtape of feeling a bit better absolutely yeah it's like <laughs> a yeah a comforting dj set <laughs> oh Perfect. thank you both so much for being here matt thank you for this new book um and for all of your your wonderful work and thank you mm -hmm. to everybody in the audience um tonight for sharing your evening with us um, I don't know if Mar uh, Mari and Matt, you have anything else that you wish to say before we end oh, for the uh, evening. Alex, and it was absolutely wonderful to chat to you, Mary. It was so 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 brilliant. And um, yeah, I, I've been looking at Mari's art uh, on um, Instagram, and um, I, I love everything. Um, we we need a Mari Matt collaboration at some point. Oh right? my gosh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My dream. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. And thanks for staying up. This was a joy and an honor. Like I said, I've been a, I've been a big, big fan for years as an understatement. And uh, it was really, really lovely to talk to you. Thanks for your thoughtful answers. Gave me a lot to think about and breathe about. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you guys. Thanks. And you, I can't wait to do real life event with you guys at some point. That'd be great. Yes. All right then. See you. Bye everyone. See you all then. Bye. Bye.